From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights, with your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers Insiders, Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Rant. Steve Politi here, joined by Pat, Brian. We've got a fun show here, a little heading into the summer we are going to wrap up the 2021-2022 season. Uh, lots to talk about what happened at Rutgers this year. Sort of a, one of the better years in, in recent history. Uh, but before we do that, we've got some major basketball news to, to go over, guys. I can't think of a more significant day for Steve Peichel's men's basketball team than the one he had last week. Uh, the big news, first piece of big news, Caleb McConnell coming back for a fifth year uh, gives Rutgers their best defensive player. One of the best returning players, I would say in the big 10 and probably uh, even more significant news, the biggest recruit of the Steve Peichel era, Gavin Griffiths from Connecticut in the fold reminds me of a young Mike Dunleavy. I don't know if you're going to agree with that one, not or Fonseca. I'll let you choose, Brian, you covered both of these stories for us, which is the more significant development go. Well, it, it might be a cop out answer. I think they're each significant for, for separate times, right? Like, Gravin doesn't come in until after Caleb graduates. They won't be able to play together. I don't. I do think they're both huge. I think Steve Peichel had a huge week last week in that his youngest daughter wins a national championship. So there's an added national championship in that household. The standard elevates there. So then he had to, you know, make up for that. He gets Caleb coming back, which apparently was shakier than a lot of people, including myself, thought it was a done deal expected for weeks. Went out to the wire, apparently. He had a workout with the Nets on Wednesday just before. Uh, but ultimately, obviously, decided to come back, which is huge. He gets it. He's the first major NIL owner at Rutgers, right. which is also huge with yeah. the, the Knights of the Raritan. Um, it's him coming back is huge just to have a veteran presence, an elite defender coming back, some stability there. So you have three returning starters. And uh, it probably won't be a rebuilding year anymore because of that. It, it alleviates some pressure to have to get another guy out of the portal now where – you know, the well is pretty dry at this point. We're entering mid-June. So to have to replace Caleb McConnell is hard already to do it at this point would be hard. So that's huge news in that, right? Yeah. And the Gavin Griffin. Let's, let's start there. Let's start. Let's, before, before we go to Gavin, let's let's break this down because I think it is it is sort of a, a fascinating guy to come back because there's upside there too, right? You know, obviously he's not going to become, he's not going to replace Ron Harper Jr. scoring. But our last vision of him, <laughs> you know, out there in Dayton, Ohio, which part of me is still there during that double overtime game. When you 22 points, double double, I mean, it, it, it just seemed to find his offensive game. Now, Pat, I'm not, I'm not saying he's going to become Geo Baker, but there is a sense there. All right, so you're 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 bringing back a guy who you know, really does have an opportunity to prove part of his game that he didn't show a lot with the absence of a couple guys that were leaving the roster. No question. I think that's been Caleb McConnell's story at Rutgers too, right? He's a guy that's kind of overcome a lot of adversity and was never expected to be a superstar type player, but has really created that mold for himself. So you're right. That game against Notre Dame, the game plan worked perfectly towards him and he's always stepped up in big moments. So when you have a guy like that with experience and, and, and does all the little things, right. He's, he's the key piece of a a Pico program. I think, it's fantastic to have him back and just just a really good guy to be uh, leading the way. All right. So for a second, let's break down the starting lineup then. Um, you got Caleb, you got Big Cliff, you got Paul. Who, who, now, who else are you plugging in there? You, give, give, give me what you think the starting five is going to be. I think Cam Spencer, the uh, Loyola Maryland transfer, is a shoo-in to be the second guard next to uh, Paul Mulcahy. Really? And okay. then, yeah, he's, he's going to be the scoring. He's not going to replace Ron Harper, quote unquote, but mm-hmm. he'll be the scoring plug there. And then the fourth spot, I think, is the most fascinating one on the roster in that it could be Andre Hyatt or it could be Moat Mag. I think Andre Hyatt probably has the advantage there because of his experience, his stability. I think Mag's ceiling is higher. And when he was healthy, when he wasn't having a litany of dental issues and just a ton of the bad luck he had last year, he really showed something. Like the Purdue game, a lot of people talk about Ron's three awesome right. finish. and his, But Moat's cut and dunk at the end of that game was massive. And a lot of the defensive uh, things he does that maybe don't get noticed are huge, scrappy guy. I think that battle will probably end up being with Andre, but I could totally see by you know February, March, 
Moat Mag taking over and, and owning that four spot. So, um, but to answer your question, it would be yes, Paul McKay, Cam Spencer, uh, I'm blanking, Caleb McConnell, uh, <laughs> Andre Hyatt, and uh, Cliff Amore. And then the backup five will be interesting to see where they go there. Uh, yeah. But that's going a little too far into the semantics. We could say that for September. Is that an NCAA tournament team? It's a great question. I, I, it depends on a lot on the strength of the uh, non-conference schedule, which based on some of the reports leaking out is not looking terribly strong. They might get some, some games against high major opponents on neutral courts this season, which is something Rutgers fans have wanted. Uh, those are in the works. Whether they come to fruition or not will, will be seen, but getting two or three of those will be huge. Um, and then the Big Ten, if it's as good as usual, which with a lot of guys coming back, a lot of the transfers coming in is very possible. Um, I mean, Rutgers fans will be excited that they think they can beat Indiana 100 times out of 100 now, given the last few years. Yeah. Indiana's going to be the favorite to win the Big Ten. That's amazing. So, yep. And, and listen, I'm, I'm all about the Indiana hype. I'm falling all in on the deep end. So uh, I expect Indiana to win the Big Ten. But if Rutgers can beat them, again, those would be huge wins that they can rack up. Right. Uh, I'm stalling. I don't know if this is an NCAA tournament yeah. team. I really don't. And this is in the mix. I mean, you can say yes. you can start the season with some hope. If someone I mean, tells me Rutgers is an NCAA tournament team, I'm not going to think they're crazy for saying that. No, right. I think it's certainly possible. Right. Uh, and it is fascinating. You mentioned a couple of things there. First, I don't, I don't want to, if we don't, we don't have the full non-conference schedule, but holy no, holy no, he's really not going to do that again. Is he? We're not going to go through this again with that. Can we possibly do that? There will be a lot of a lot of cupcakes. I mean, it's just well, there always is, but there's got to be. It can't just be, you know, six teams below 300 RPI. We can't play that game, can we? Come on. Well, there are efforts to like schedule good, good to great teams. Like the efforts are there. Whether they again, whether those come to fruition or not, it's all that matters. But the efforts are there. Now, to your point, yes, are they scheduling teams teams that aren't just bad, but really, really bad? I mean, yes, that, that just seems to be what's going to happen. Central Connecticut State's probably going to be on the schedule, and they're terrible. But, That's again, good. all yeah. that matters is when you play those teams, it's not great to be playing those teams, but when you do play those teams, you have to obliterate them. You can't beat them by 10. You have to beat them by 30, 40. Or, or you can't lose by two. All right. What about St. Peter's? Are we going to get St. Peter's now that they have three players left on their team this year? <laughs> That's the perfect time for them to schedule St. Peter's. Isn't <laughs> yeah. it? I think St. Peter's is too good of a program to schedule, in my opinion. <laughs> Come on, you gotta stop, stop, uh, man. All right, that's something we can worry about when the schedule comes out. Uh, now, Fonseca brought up a good point about NIL, and this is finally the way NIL was intended. Is how it worked with Caleb McConnell. It's not the way it's going on in the rest of the country, which is another fascinating story. You saw the headlines out of Columbus, where it's it, Ryan Day goes to the Columbus Chamber of Commerce and says that he needs $13 million to keep his team together. $13 million a year. Uh, Doug from Cleveland.com, great story. You should go read it. Uh, writes about this. At, you know, it says that he puts in there that it's not $150,000 per every player on the roster they need. It's, it's $500,000 for 25 players, which is just, I mean, astounding. If you're Greg Shelley, your head probably exploded when you read this. With that backdrop, the way it worked here at Rutgers, the Knights of the Raritan came up with some cash to do with, with a player who with Caleb was on the bubble, given a thought this helped sway him to stay. Pat, that's the way it's intended. That is the way it's intended. And, but obviously like all things in college athletics, it's not going to go that way. Right. So no. <laughs> Rutgers, I'm sure Shiano is preparing some similar presentation for Governor Murphy in the state of New Jersey and trying 13 to 13 million our, though, 13 million. Listen, I, it's never going to happen. I mean, our like biggest gross domestic product is Bruce Springsteen. And I don't know where he falls on the, on the uh, Rutgers spectrum, but. Can Bruce just buy us a running back? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Straight out of like maybe Colts neck high or something, <laughs> but uh, regardless, it just will not, uh, c cannot be a great thing for Rutgers if Ohio state is raising the, the, that type of money and all the other national title contenders are on that level and 75 percent of the rest of the country are at a high school level essentially right. well at least so, it, uh, right at least it is it is not just Rutgers is in the boat with with the team that, right. that the teams that right. cannot come up with 13 million dollars anyway Caleb McConnell we don't know what he got but give John Don Newman Danny the whole crowd Jeff Towers everyone involved in that uh Knights of the Rat and did what it was supposed to do swayed him to stay so that was the good news interesting news on the other side while we're talking about uh segue back to gavin griffiths this was not a player who required a payment to come 
Brian, you wrote a great story. I mean, if you haven't read it, Rutgers fans uh, out of East Har- out of Hartford, uh, Har- where's he from again? From Hartford area? Or? So he's from Simsbury. He goes to Simsbury. high school in West Hartford. West Hartford. Gotcha. Just, uh, and just about his recruitment. And it was the way, I mean, the way Steve Peichel's going to get players. It's about building relationships. It's about working his butt off. Uh, it, just some fantastic details in there. My favorite in this story is Steve Peichel went to high school with the same time with uh, Griffith's dad and took a picture of their all state team. Was it right out of the New Haven register or something and, and framed it and put it on his desk? I mean, that, that's some, that is some great stuff right there. Right. So yes, they played high school basketball about 20 minutes away from each other. Uh, his uh, Larry Griffiths played at Cheshire. Uh, Steve played at uh, St. Paul in Bristol and they were on the same class L all state team in the New wow. Haven register. He yeah. clipped it out. I, I'm assuming he had it already. I don't think he went back in the archives 40 years and got the, uh, <laughs> got the clip, but he got it and he framed it and he put it on his desk so that uh, Karen, uh, Gavin's mother and Gavin saw it when they walked in and Karen's Karen thought it was very funny that Steve was acting like he had it there all the time. Like it was just a yeah. constant decoration. And I asked her, like, are you serious? You really don't think he has a class L all state high school team just flexing on everybody. And she laughed and said, no, but yes, it's details like that, that, make Steve a really good recruit. These are the things that Steve is really good at personal things uh, and building that relationship. And yeah. Gavin is the kind of kid, like you mentioned, high character kid. Uh, he's gone to one prep school. He went to Simsbury high school as a freshman reclassified. Now he's been at Kingswood Oxford for four years. He, uh, he has a strong family nucleus. Uh, he's not looking to be a social media superstar. He's not into any of these, a lot, mm-hmm. like a lot of these modern kids. He's just a, down earth family kid who Pico connected with really well. They had a lot of things in common, grew up in Connecticut and big families. They really connected on that. Um, and yeah, and like you mentioned, when you tweeted out the story, his first game at the rack was the Lafayette loss, the disaster. Yeah, and they still got him. Yep. Yeah. And, and they're, they're in the locker room. They're wondering, they're seeing all these d- distraught kids. They're seeing the mood of the pair of the fans leaving the arena. And they're like, I don't think Steve's going to want to spend time with us, which I mean, obviously they understand, right? Yeah. That's just, as Larry put it, as brutal of a loss as you possibly can have at that level. And he not, Steve not only spent time with them, he spent two hours with them. He toured the facilities with them. Yeah. If he could have spent all night with them, he would have. So uh, that was something that really stuck out to them. So uh, yeah, I, I think this is, if if Steve was ever going to get a top 50 elite prospect, this was the kind of kid. And to his credit, he locked him up because schools like Michigan really wanted him. Right. UConn wanted him, Virginia Tech. This is a, kid, a sought after kid. And Steve Peichel was able to close out and, and lock the kid up. Yeah. And, and that, and that's the kind of recruit they're going to have to get if Steve Peichel's taken a lot of heat for his recruiting. Uh, not always, not always fair. I think obviously, you know, he, he's certainly not getting, you know, three top hundred recruits. I don't think Rutgers is ever going to get that that way, Pat, but I mean, you get cliff, you get one of the you get best player in New Jersey that year. Here's the top 30 recruit a couple of years later. I don't know. I mean, Paul McKay might've been one of the five best players out of that class. I don't know. I mean, what do you, what do we expect? I was shocked. I saw on Twitter that Griffiths was actually ranked one spot higher than Bronny James and uh, LeBron son. Really? Like, oh my God, this is amazing. Right? Like, right. We give Ronnie Steve James gets no NIL. Yeah. He just he just out recruited LeBron James's son, right? So that was <laughs> that's uh, a, a I didn't say that. that's great, bit, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's he as I think all you guys have reported over the years, he gets guys that fit his system, right? Like Paul Mulcahy was a guy that could come in and fit his system perfectly. Big Cliff was like the big recruit that he had to have, but even Griffiths was apparently ranked higher than than Cliff was, so. I think he's doing a great job in recruiting. It just doesn't have the flash that becomes part of recruiting, right? Like recruiting is all about how can we wow people and how, what pictures can we put up with these kids? And like, these kids are making hype videos, right? That's not the Pikel style in my opinion. Right. So I think, I think he's done a great job recruiting. We'll see how the re- results uh, turn out in a couple of years with Griffiths. All right, let's move on to the next topic. And we're going to do this year review. It's our SBs for, for Rutgers sports, 21, 22 year. Um, again, like I said, at the, at the top, I don't know if you're looking for the pantheon of good Rutgers performances, NCAA in basketball bowl game. I, I know it wasn't you know, it came under strange circumstances, but Rutgers still has a Gator bowl in their bio for the year. Uh, Big 10 regular season champs, tournament champs. All right, here's how we're going to do this guys. We're going to take six categories. We're each going to pick a different answer. So 
if and we're going to do a snake draft like your fantasy football draft for each category so if you're third up and two have been taken you're gonna have to scramble and come up with another answer because we want we want some variety here so here we go all right let's start with team of the year i'm gonna go first because i have seniority on uh, on the podcast and because I, I i don't i can't imagine who i would come up with if i didn't was i wasn't able to choose who i could i think i really do think the team of the year for Rutgers athletics 2021 22 is the women's soccer team not only winning the first big 10 regular season title in Rutgers history which i think is bit is bigger than a tournament title which they suggest dominance throughout the entire year i believe they were undefeated but also making it to the college cup making it to the final four I believe that, and they've done it almost entirely with New Jersey players, which is fantastic. Michael New's got a pipeline from the, uh, from his PDA club program. Uh, it's the I think it is the blueprint for how Rutgers should be successful going forward. He's got it going on. I don't know when they'll have the breakthrough to win a national championship, but if you were to pick a team that's in the lead for that, it would be this team. They are my pick. Women's soccer team of the year. Fonseca, you go next since you have second seniority, which I know is not much. Who is your 2021-22 team of the year? I do want to say that your take on the regular season being, uh, I, I don't remember what the word you used. I totally agree. Regular season titles are infinitely more impressive. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I would say men's lacrosse for many of the similar reasons that you said. They didn't win a Big Ten regular season or tournament title, but that's because they finished second to one of the greatest men's lacrosse teams in the history of the sport. Maryland is just an absolute wagon first undefeated champion in like over a decade. They haven't, they, their only loss in the last two years was in a national championship game last year. So I don't think anybody could have reasonably expected the Rutgers to beat them. And aside from that, they finished second place in the big 10, second place in the big 10 tournament They make the program's first final four. They finally break through and do something that a lot of people think that th- thought they always had the potential to do. They came within one overtime period of doing it last year. They finally did it. And uh, Brian Breck has shown that he can, but not only build the program, but rebuild it, replace two elite attackers with a guy in Ross Scott he had on the roster who's you know tying the single season record for goals and for and points and things of that nature. So uh, I would argue that they are uh, team of the year. All right, Lanny, who you got? All right, well, being third and uh, least <laughs> amount of seniority on here should be a difficult pick, but because Rutgers had such a great year, this is not a hard pick. My team of the year is field hockey, oh, which okay. I know you talked about the regular season being very impressive, but think about this from a, from an outsider perspective. Rutgers field hockey was the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, right? that's a good point. Un- unbelievably impressive feat. Yep. They get the number one overall seed. I say they lost. Um, it, I think it was in the quarterfinals to Liberty in a shootout. I think, but um, awesome season. Uh, Coach Civico is kind of doing the same thing that you talked about, Steve, with bringing in the great pipeline of New Jersey players. She got some extra, some girls to come back for an extra year just to give it one last go after the pandemic kind of took away some of their best potential. So field hockey, tremendous season, uh, Big Ten champs, of course, and the number one overall seed in the NCAA tournament, uh, a feat that hasn't been done at Rutgers so far. So right. my pick, field Excellent. hockey. Excellent. Good choice. All right, next category, athlete of the year. Now, how does the snake draft go? Who goes first? <laughs> I, I don't know. Is it you? It's Brian? supposed to be me. It's supposed to wait, but we have we have four. We're, we have we're six sneaking. categories. We're it is a, it's a snake draft, yeah. Okay. So the person that picked last in the, the oh. last category picks first. Yeah. All right. Okay. So Pat, you've got it. Athlete of oh, the man. year. Who is your <laughs> Rutgers 2021-22 athlete of the year? Wow. Wow. Okay. So I was coming up with some wild card oddball type picks originally, and I didn't think I would have the first overall pick here. So <laughs> let me readjust my strategy. Oh boy. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to stick with my guy uh, just because for those who know, I was a big high school wrestling reporter over the years. And so my pick is going to be Seb- Sebastian Rivera from the wrestling team. Okay. Good and Seabass C- was a guy coming out of high school, had an awesome career went to Northwestern, came back to Rutgers, um, is one of those guys that just like loves Jersey, is Jersey wrestling. His dad has a club in Jersey. So Seabass, a multi-time NCAA All-American, uh, Big Ten champ, finished off a tremendous career at Rutgers and now is going to be giving back to Rutgers in a similar sense like Ashnall did as part of the Scarlet Knights Wrestling Club. So my pick of the year, Sebastian Rivera, only lost like I think five matches total in his entire Rutgers career. 
think about a think about a year at Rutgers where we could come up with three teams and wrestling not be one of them. That's pretty amazing. Right. All right, right. Fonseca, you get the next pick. Athlete of the year, go. Uh, Ron Herbert Jr., honorable mention All American, highest All Big Ten selection in program history, uh, led them to back to back NCAA tournaments. Almost led them to, led them to their historic upset over Purdue. Had that tremendous shot against uh, uh, Indiana, both the shot itself and the awesome celebration. Uh, almost carried them over Notre Dame, uh, and is probably going to be the first player to be picked uh, in over a decade. At least he has a chance to. So uh, yeah, but Ron Harper Jr. All right, that's a good one. Uh, as the third pick, I'm going to do the sentimental favor and go with Geo Baker, fifth year player. Uh, finished a remarkable career transforming this from program from uh, just a laughing stock into into something that back to back NCAA tournaments uh, made this incredible decision to step away from basketball to continue to be in the Rutgers community with what he's doing, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, it's just an amazing sort of decision on his part suggests his maturity as a young person, which you already knew. Uh, but I think when we look back on the most important athletes of the 20th, 21st century for, for Rutgers, Geo Baker will be on the short list. So I'm going to give him my nod as Rutgers Athlete of the Year. All right. Next category. Rutgers Game of the Year. Wait, no, Coach of the Year. I'm sorry. Rutgers Coach of the Year. All right. Did I go first again? So you never go first, Fonseca? Is that what you're telling me? You never go first in this. Yes. The, being the middle child, as always, is the <laughs> first. You never go first. All right. So I go first. Uh, and I think the uh, the Coach of the Year is Brian Breck. I got, you know, if you were looking at the cross team and what he did, he, he lost his best player from the year before uh, the cursed brother. Okay, we'll get which, which cursed I get the curse. I mix up my curse since there's 14 of them uh, uh, to be curse able to the curse, the curse of the curse, Connor cursed, right? Do you lose Connor cursed or Connor stayed Cooper cursed? Colin Connor cursed. cursed, Colin cursed. Thank you. Colin Connor cursed. cursed scored against Colin cursed in the curse bowl uh, in the final four. Gotcha. Right. Okay. Anyway, so to be able to regroup, to be able to reload the way he has, he's done the transfer portal better than uh, anybody at Rutgers to get that team uh, from making the MCLA tournament to the next step to getting to the final four. I think he uh, did the best coaching job of anyone in Piscataway. Fonseca, who's your choice? This is really tough because I have two coaches that I think are very deserving. I'm going to give the nod to my Hometown guy, Mike O'Neill, Soccer Town USA, Carney's own. Uh, perfect regular season, which again, as we touched on, is super impressive. To go undefeated in a regular season, I don't think they even tied. I think they won every game, which is very impressive. You win the first Big Ten regular season title in school history, make it to the Final Four. Uh, built, uh, this is as much a lifetime achievement award as it is a this award. He's built this program to be arguably the most successful program in the athletic department, and they sh- they've shown no signs of slowing down. So I uh, got a couple of players drafted even, so. Uh, I, I would say Mike O'Neill, which you could probably argue this every season, but I would argue right. he's the coach of the year this year. Lanny, third pick, who do you got? Just for the fact that there will be lights at the baseball stadium, uh, we'll go with Steve uh, Owens. Uh, good pick. Yes, this is a good one. Right? This is a program revival yeah. type situation. He's come in and done such a great job, of course. And here you go for any future coaches out there. What's your coaching legend or coaching response after your team gets snubbed in the NCAA state tournament like that? Like, how do you inspire your guys for next year? How do you, what, what's your message? And I'm sure being in that locker room that day, everyone's devastated, but I'm sure he had some amazing, amazing words. So uh, a guy that's rebuilt the program inspirational and, and has this team on a great trajectory. All right. Game of the year. Wait, uh, can, can wait. I say a couple things? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, right. One, what, the other person I had who I think is worth mentioning, Melissa Le- Lemon, Melissa Lehman. I apologize for not knowing how to say her last name, but the woman's Le- Le- coach, Lehman. Lehman. Coach Lehman. Yeah. Thank you. She uh, took over a program a couple of years yeah. ago that was treading water for you know decades, never really had much success, make back to back NCAA tournaments, won a game in both of those NCAA tournaments, and is really starting to, at least from what I can gather, deserves mention, right. build on the pipeline of, uh, New Jersey talent in that sport. So she's worth mention. And mm-hmm. do you want to get into baseball now or do you want to do that later? What, we'll do We'll do it later. Yeah. All right. We, yeah. And we should have mentioned, we should have mentioned Steve Peichel in this category to give, give him credit for turning that, turning that ship around when it looked pretty grim. So that's another, a lot of, a lot of good coaching jobs in Piscataway. Absolutely. All right. Game of the year. You're up. You get the first choice, Pat. I think it's obvious, but you All tell right. me. Well, listen, listen, I was not here at that time. So I'm going to pass the basketball literally to you okay. guys All right. figuratively. Ooh. I, you know, I, I'm not here to build a fantasy juggernaut. I, it is what it is. So I'll, I'll pass you guys the basketball. 
And with that, um, I'm going to go with women's soccer in the NCAA tournament, won back-to-back games and penalty kicks. Wow. Uh, I, don't, I can't even give you which one, uh, but let's just go with one of those games in the NCAA <laughs> tournament where they won on penalty sh- sh- in a penalty shootout, the ultimate way pressure situation to advance. So I'm sure Good. that was one of the most thrilling moments of the year. All right, Brian, you got your pick of basketball games. And I didn't see this coming since there certainly are some incredible games to pick from. There are two that I that I would uh, choose from. I will choose the Purdue game easiest. Yeah, I think that's the one you were referencing. It's an all time classic, a game that fans will remember the the result of that game and the game winning shot for years before they remember how the rest of the season went. Uh, The iconic photo of Ron Harper Jr. making that shot from half court will be all over the rack. Et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's an all-timer for Rutgers, so I think that's probably the easiest. Uh, th- thank, you, thank you, Pat, for giving me the layup. Seriously. All right. I, th- I now I'm going to do. I'm going to use Yes Network rules for my pick because I think obviously a better game would be the Notre Dame NCAA tournament game. They lost the game, so in Yes Network classic Yankees rules, we will never see that game ever played again. But I will tell you the game that I the game I saw first in person that surprised me. And I thought it was just a remarkable game was the win over Ohio State in basketball. Uh, and they don't get to the NCAA tournament. They don't win that game. I think they're down 10 points and scored the, or scored the final 10 points of the game in the last four minutes, shut them out. I mean, just a crazy finish where you weren't sure what's going to be. Yeah, it was, just, it was just during that run where every game, and I remember writing a column like, don't worry about what happens next what you're seeing now is just so much fun. And it was just like a fun two weeks where they were in every game. Every game was crazy. Uh, they were winning a lot of the, the night during that incredible run of over top 25 teams to get them back uh, into the NCAA tournament. That to me was the one I sticks out in my mount memory as the rack being the rack again after COVID as well. So that, that was really, that was the one I think was a lot of fun. All, All right. right. I'll give you my Indiana basketball story since I wasn't there obviously you guys were there I was driving to Atlantic City for the high school wrestling tournament that night on Thursday so I'm listening to the game on the radio I get to the parking deck at uh the hotel we're staying at Mm -hmm. and of course giant concrete structure my radio signal goes (laughs) right and this is exactly at the point where uh I would later find out that someone got a technical and uh they gave the ball back to Indiana and it was just a oh complete my God. disaster. Yeah. So that I'm, Indiana I'm, game. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yeah, that one. The, so I'm running through hard rock casino, like trying to find a TV where Rutgers will be on to watch like this final seconds of, of this crazy, crazy game. And I have no idea what's going on. I'm, I'm like texting everyone, like what the frick is going on? Like, I, I don't know. Anyway, I find it on Twitter and it was like unbelievable ending, obviously. So. It's if crazy. I, get second, I forgot. Be, I forgot that, about that. One. That Indiana game yeah. with Ron hitting that another game winner. Unbelievable. Just silencing that uh, assembly hall crowd, which was Jeez. A, a sensational moment. If you're a Rutgers yeah. fan. Yeah. All right. Well, that I want to make that your. I'm going to answer this question. Moment of the year is our next category. So let's make that your moment of the year because that was pretty. Fair. Fit, Fair. That's pretty Fair. fantastic. I'm not. I'm here. All right. That means fun second. You go next. I'm not going to let you have the Ron Harper shot because that's too obvious. So what yeah. if I take that one away? What is your moment of the year for 2021 22? Uh, the Gavin Wimsat debut. No, pass. no, I'm gonna take that one. That's, that's what you get. Oh, that's what market. I get. I deserve it, don't yeah. I? Shoot. You try to play God, you got played. Yes, Gavin <laughs> Wimsat. What if Gavin Wimsat turns out to be the player that everyone hopes he will become if he leaves Rutgers to you know a huge win at the big house or at the shoe or whatever? And all and all the bandwagon Rutgers fans will be like, Yeah, yeah. The the real quote unquote Rutgers fans will be like, I was there in Champaign when he threw that fourth and five dart to Bo Melton to convert <laughs> and win that huge 20 to 14 game, which is why we made the Gator Bowl. That's what real quote unquote real Rutgers fans will say. And that's thank you, Steve, for, yeah. for uh gifting me that uh the easiest. I mean, this is the state draft is falling to me. I feel like uh, I you feel do. like the Jets. All the picks are falling in my lap. Yeah, this is like this is like when I got I got Jonathan Taylor in my foot fantasy football league draft this year. Thanks to my position. All right, uh, yeah. So I mean, I, what would what would give me help me out? What would the other moment if I can't use Ron shot? I can't use the other Ron shot. Uh, I can't use Wimsat. What's the other moment of the year? I'm trying to think of one that would top that. I mean, here you go. You love this one. You, and you mentioned this at the, at the press, at the uh, ba- women's basketball press conference, Jonathan Holloway catching the punt in a spring game. That, <laughs> come on. Though. 
<laughs> just the bars on the ground with with, with with athletic with university presidents doing things that are somewhat athletic after the last few we've had that's a good one i guess here's a couple um, i have written yeah. down uh right. ruckers getting the bowl bid just not them playing it yeah. but just the fact the way that unfolded that was uh, interesting bo melton and isaiah pacheco getting drafted on the same day that 30 yeah, minutes it was a so. good moment for football certainly yeah okay uh, all right uh, all the basketball ones we touched upon already those seem you know we yeah we, we, debbie cheney going back to that right. um the you know the that we talked about the championships yeah all right uh, i'll throw one more outsider one year away steve okay this right. is this is uh really out there so pen relays Rutgers goes oh. one two in the long jump you are going out there who also won the pen relays in long jump all from jersey god it was just, it was a real man. real track moment of fantastic jersey ties to win the pen relays is a huge deal that's good. If you guys don't know Pat, Pat is a track nerd, so that's great. All right, last wait, category. Wait, here's one for you, Polity. What? Me getting that red roof in Dayton. How about no, that? Oh, that is the moment. <laughs> there it is. Clearly the moment of the year that you're getting the red roof in Dayton. Uh, only week after I made you get the shrimp cocktail, St. Elmo's for the first time. That There you go. That that covers it. I think that's my moment of the year. The look on your face when you pull up to the parking lot and see that this yeah. is what I was saying. That right. is, that's the photo of the year, if I can That think. is the photo of the year. I, was, I almost didn't want to didn't want to kept the car and want to stop the car there. There's a free, okay. Um, all right, one more category disappointment of the year. What one thing disappointed you from the way this year ended? I think it's your turn, Pat, right? Or is it my turn? Your turn, Pat. What was the one? What was the one thing that disappointed you? Um, wh- I'm, I'm gonna go out there again. Women's lacrosse, uh, losing at Stony Brook, they had this great story of redemption going back to the place. And right. to face the same team that they were going to play in the NCAA tournament uh, for the second year in a row. So but there was a, a great story there that, you know, Rutgers women's lacrosse is having this amazing season. They finally, not finally, but just the path led them back to redemption and unfortunately uh, lost at Stony Brook again. So I thought that was a little bit of a disappointment. You got one, Brian? Yeah, for all for all the praise I had of the women's soccer program, the great season they had, <clears throat> they had a chance of finally winning a Big Ten tournament. They had it; they were hosting the final. All you know, great support at Ursac Field, and they just weren't able to do it. So uh, it's a mild disappointment given how good the season yeah. was, uh, and that's just part of the bigger picture. Which, not to steal anything you're going to say, but Rutgers went one. They went, Rutgers reached five Big Ten tournament championship games. They went wow. one and four. Mm-hmm. That's a pretty large, big picture disappointment. That it's good for Rutgers that they're reaching those heights. Those are heights that they wouldn't have reached, you know, three, four years ago, but now that they're getting there, they're losing. And the next step is obviously to start you know, winning some of those championships. All right. I want to take the, the Rutgers football loss to Maryland in the regular season finale when they had a chance to clinch a bowl game on their own merits. And I realized it worked out anyway, they got to a bowl, but still to get their doors blown off by uh, the Terps 40 to 16 uh, in front of their home crowd was not a good look. And that is my disappointment of the year. All right, it was fun. Good recap, guys. I think we covered everything. Um, As I said at the top, again, I think that really it's hard to argue that this is anything but a a good year for the Scarlet Knights overall uh, with the number of, of, with the success they had across the board with, you know, some some exceptions, but for the most part, going to be, going to be, and I, I think, the way they people down there look at it is more than just a good year, but a building block kind of year that things are trending upward. I agree. All right. So we could do, do quick true false. Then we're going to get some reader questions and true false will tie into the other developments here that we have in, in Piscataway coming up. All right. So really quick, true false. Coquez Washington was the right hire for Rutgers women's basketball. Fun second, true or false. I don't know if that's a true or false question, but I guess I'll say true. All right, Pat. True. Uh, I'm going to say true only because I think of the circumstances that there weren't many other candidates the way the search went. Uh, true or false, Caleb McConnell will finish his year, his career as an All-American. Fonseca, can it get to that level? True or false? False. Pat? True. Love true. defense. Love defense? All right. False. I don't think defense gets you there, unfortunately. Uh, all right. True or false? Geo Baker's retirement was 2022's most stunning Rutgers news. Fonseca, do you see that one coming? I'll say false. I, I think you could kind of anticipate it if you, if you read the tea leaves close enough. Pat? Just like Brian said, false. 
no, I'm going, I'm going true because I just never seen anyone with a chance to play, not play. So I was, I was blown away. All right. Uh, true or false. The best program in Piscataway right now is men's lacrosse. One second, true or false. This is a great question. I'm going to go with, uh, true. All right. Okay. Pat. Go false. I think you touched on the women's soccer success. Yeah, I'm going to go false with soccer as well, but it is close. It is close. All right. And finally, true or false? Baseball did not get hosed with its NCAA tournament stub. Schedule better. Fonseca, true or false? True. Oh, boy. Oh, I knew you were going to do that too. Pat? False. Yeah, false. Like, I mean, you can't finish second. <laughs> Why be in the Big Ten if you're going to finish second? It, the two things. Number one, you finish second in a regular season. You should get in the NCAA tournament. You're in the Big Ten. But the second thing is, and Ron Garuti pointed this out, and I thought something was wrong. I'm trying to follow the, the, the tournament out, and Rutgers gets into the final game. hadn't lost yet. And I just assumed, just assumed that, that they were still, if they lost the first game, to Michigan that they there'd be another game and I was googling I sitting here googling it like what how is it over they did this this is double elimination right how do you that's have this wor- format that's incredible that's, that's ridiculous that was worse than the NCAA tournament snub in my opinion that was just what, unbelievable. who came up with that I've never is that is that something that gets used other places I've never seen something like that wow. the Big Ten's done it for a while it, they have uh, he's brutal. Literally, right. baseball uses double. You about to say, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just the whole. So they get knocked out, and on that, I mean, that to me, just the whole thing was kind of kind of lousy, kind of lousy way to end it. Um, and that's a good segue to our first insider question. Uh, thanks for subscribing, everybody. Rutgers insider. We're still texting out stuff. Uh, Todd Hunt has been on a rampage with recruiting stuff. So if you don't subscribe to our our service, you're really missing out. So uh, here's our first question: Was I'm still in shock that the baseball team failed to get a bid besides beating Michigan in the big 10 tournament. What else could the team have done to get in stronger out of conference schedule, maybe a big 10 representative on the selection committee. Does someone at the NCAA above the committee review the performance and selecting to avoid repeated mistakes as leaving uh, Rutgers out clearly was, I I can't pretend to have any knowledge on this guys. I mean, RPI get it. Uh, The schedule is weak. The big 10 overall was weak. I mean, Ken, is it a, is it a non? How do you schedule non conference midweek games that are better? Because I know that's when they play the Princeton's, Princeton's, and the, you know, other other teams. I mean, what's the answer, Brian? Since you said you said th- you they should schedule better, I will say that they had a very tough draw. It is a very complex issue, right? But yeah, so they had very unlucky. They were very unlucky that the Big Ten was as down as it was this year. A ton of teams had a down year. Obviously, it's fair to assume that that's why Rutgers had such a great season. If the Big Ten was as good as it usually is, will they win 44 games? I think it's hard to say that they would. They won 44 games. Steve, I'm going to put you on the spot. How many of those 44 wins were quad one wins? Uh, uh, four? I don't know. Was it 12? One. one. One? They had wow. one quad one win. They really? had six quad one opportunities. They went one and five. If they had okay. beat Maryland, an extra, they went one and two at home against Maryland. Right. They went one and two on the road against Michigan. Yeah. And listen, as you said, they had the bid, the bid right in front of them. They were playing Michigan. Uh, in the Big Ten Championship. If you just win that game, it's, but it's baseball. You lose games in baseball. They, they had a terrible non-conference schedule, as you mentioned, uh, and they lost home games to Princeton and they lost on the road to Seton Hall, two teams that are bad, right? So it's just, a, it's it's a mixture of all these things. And look, there are teams that Rutgers uh, got, p- there are teams that were picked over Rutgers that were on the bubble. They, Dallas Baptist. I saw so many people, people saying, who is Dallas Baptist? which is a fair question because I had a similar question. I don't know who, who Dallas Baptist is. I do know ba- Dallas Baptist had eight quad one wins playing in one of the worst conferences in the country. They had eight times as many quad one wins as Rutgers. So I don't think that it's the lack of a Big Ten representative on the NCAA tournament committee that is the reason Rutgers didn't go. I think it's because Rutgers didn't play anybody, Paul. They didn't beat anybody good. Then they, you know, they their 44-win record looks great. It's just inflated with a lot of bad teams. They swept all, I think they swept the bottom four teams in the Big Ten who were all terrible. And to your question about the Big Ten tournament, why they played so late, the first day got rained out that Wednesday. All the coaches agreed that following day in a meeting to just play the, the tournament as scheduled. They wanted all these teams to try to get wins, to build up the resumes, to get into the tournament, which obviously backfired against Rutgers. But uh, all the coaches agreed to do it in that way. 
They could have cut the format. They could have done different things. They agreed to this. So it, it, it is what it is. But why isn't it double elimination? That's the only but thing that doesn't make any yeah, sense. It, they had so little time anyway. They'd have to cramp in an extra game. If like So Michigan beats Rutgers. They play a second game. When, when would they play that game? Monday morning before the selection show? I don't know. I mean, started on Tuesday. I don't know. Anyway, it's just, it, seems, it just seems completely ridiculous. But all right, to your point. Yeah, schedule harder, but I mean, I mean, he might. Steve Owens might have been in a position where he he just didn't see he didn't see that this was going to be a strength of schedule question. You yeah. beat Nebraska, you expect some of these teams in the Big Ten would be better than they were. I don't know. It, it's, it's hard. It's, it's hard to schedule non conference, especially when you live in the Northeast, because yeah. no right. one's coming up here in February when it's thirty degrees outside. Right. And I don't, you know, it's hard. It, it it is. I empathize with the difficulty of scheduling, but I'm just explaining the reasons why you know right. this ended up happening all right a couple more questions before we sign off uh looking forward to the podcast thanks joe my question is about women's basketball how many season tickets are there now and is the new regime expected to help or hurt with sales in the short term all right so joe i mentioned this in my column i can't remember the numbers but it was certainly i think about 800 maybe is the number of season ticket holders uh so yeah i mean the program at its peak i don't think you know I had a had a huge number there, but certainly the last few years has really uh, taken a taken a hit on on the number of people who go to the rack to watch that team. It's interesting because it, for years the Rutgers women's basketball program was the one carrying the flag. As here's here's an example of what we can be. Uh, now Rutgers doesn't need it to do that anymore. I think what I saw and I Cook has Washington I thought, made, had made a good first impression at a press conference. But I also think there's a sense that, all right, check back in two years, three years, guys, you were there. I mean, I don't, I don't think this gets turned around quickly. No, no, I think it's a long, it's a long, a long rebuild, which is why she got a six year contract. Right. And, and, uh, you know, leniency and, and uh, some, the, the pressure's not on right away for sure. So uh, will, will a big crowd certainly help? Yeah, of course. You know, if you can have the rack be the rack for women's basketball, I mean, that's a huge advantage. So, yeah, yeah. But selling a th- less than a thousand season tickets is not going to get the job done. All right. Rocco in Sebring, Florida has a question about football injuries. Any updates? O.L. Sutton, L.B. Walker, D.E. Toure. Uh, I think Walker's out for the year, correct? Uh, the other two I'm less certain of. Do you guys have any idea what, what we're looking at update wise? Yeah, Walker's out for the year. Uh, Shano said that. Uh, Ture is likely out long term. We never got an update on the severity of his injury, but based on what the fact that Greg Shiano brought it up, uh, it, it indicates yeah. that it's he's probably going to miss the year. I, w- I would be surprised if he plays this season. I, I guess I'll put it that way. And Sutton is still recovering. Um, yeah. I don't think he'll be ready for training camp. It probably takes a year to recover from these things. I think he got hurt in October. Um, I certainly think it's possible that he's back by the end of the year. Uh, but we don't have any concrete timeline at this time. Yeah. It is interesting that that there, if you're looking for that, where is that Achilles heel going to be for this team? It could be at linebacker, really that, that, the that position, they were counting on Walker there. Uh, that could be a big weakness. And that's not one you want to have in the big 10 with, with the uh, teams you're playing certainly. So, all right. Some, some of the look forward to next fall. Uh, all right. Here's the final question. We'll let Kay fine uh, head us out for the, for the, for the week here. As you look forward to the fall winter slate for Rutgers sports, what is the most important road meal you were looking forward to? Always ask the hard hitting questions. Thanks Kevin for that one. I mean, I, I don't look past, I don't look, I take one game at a time. So I'm looking at Boston college. I'm looking at some seafood up there. I'm looking at some chowder, look at some chowder in Boston, man. I don't know. I don't know when I'm going to get in the road again. So I'm going to start right there. We're going to have a, have a nice meal to get this thing started. I don't know if you gentlemen have, a, have something you look forward to be your first year traveling with the scarlet and ice pad. So I don't know if you're, if you're looking. Yeah. For- I don't have the full menu uh, or highlights really yet as a, as a rookie, but I will say up in new England, we went to this place one time. It's called the Nordic lodge. It's an all you can eat seafood Ooh. buffet in uh, it's actually right by URI on the way up to Boston. So if a you buffet. want to, or ever have, or when Pike will schedules URI next year, <laughs> go hit the Nordic lodge, all you can eat seafood buffet. <laughs> you got anything, Brian? Yeah, the, the coincidence here is that this I traveled with the Targo my one year as a sports editor, yeah. and all the road trips I did that year are the road trips we're doing this year. So it's like a, re, a replay of, of my uh, junior year of college. Um, I am looking forward to Matt's Bar in Minnesota. I'm going to have a Juicy Lucy. I've been dreaming about it since I had it five years ago. The greatest burger I've ever eaten in my life. 
everyone should migrate to Matt's bar. And in Ohio, in Columbus, I'm going to Buckeye's Donuts, an absolute institution, which has the best donuts I've ever had. There you go. Um, so those two spots, I would recommend everyone. I, I wouldn't even recommend. I would say it's an obligation for every Rutgers fan that's traveling to go there. And then we get the the, the annual trip to the Detroit Airport Marriott, in which and which my the scariest moment of one of my scariest moments as a traveling sports writer was that I recognized the bartender at the Detroit. <laughs> Detroit Airport Marriott. It's like, oh, this guy, I remember him. So yes, yeah, so that that that'll be a fine meal. Something to look forward to. All right, gentlemen, excellent job today. Good podcast. Thanks for all the questions. I uh, hope you're enjoying this wonderful weather, everyone. And we'll be back soon to talk some more Rucker Sports. Thanks for listening.